group, we had the preparedness at 2.45 and I see David Hurley, he has joined us. So um, we're gonna have, um, and Keisha, just for your information, the reason David Hurley is here is probably not terribly obvious since he's the director of the uh, medical board, but we put some language in the preparedness bill that affected the medical board and their ability to function in, in um, an emergency. So when we get to that, then we'll see if he's still in agreement or if he has additional things for us to consider. So that's why he's with us. So I don't know, Tucker and Amarin, how do you propose doing this? I'll just turn it over to you and you can do a nice little walkthrough for us. That's what we plan on doing, a nice little walkthrough. So uh, for the record, Tucker Anderson with the Office of Legislative Counsel, would you prefer a uh, high level overview where we focus in on some of the details that you put into the bill during the COVID response or would you prefer a meticulous and thorough walkthrough of each section? Committee, what do you think? I think at this point, a high level. Okay, that seems to be the consensus. Okay. So uh, to refresh everyone's recollection, uh, this language was originally contained in S-354 as it passed out of this committee and eventually the Senate. Uh, when this bill reached the House um, towards the end of the uh, September return session, uh, the House um, took these provisions out and replaced it with uh, a COVID emergency provision allowing Australian ballot voting at the annual meeting. Uh, so S-354 turned into the temporary authority provisions that municipalities used to convert to Australian ballot for the 2021 annual meetings. Um, I will walk through the first, I believe, six or seven sections of the bill that deal with open meeting law, municipal quasi-judicial proceedings, uh, municipal utilities and water utilities in general, um, and uh, the transfer of certain municipal funds in the case of a declared state of emergency, um, which is really just a repeal of an existing prohibition. Uh, and then I will hand it off to Amarin and try to coordinate my scrolling abilities with her excellent walkthrough abilities. <laughs> The first, <laughs> the first section of the bill uh, codifies the temporary open meeting law provisions that uh, the General Assembly passed in response to COVID-19 um, to bring everyone back to what happened starting in the spring. First, the General Assembly temporarily authorized any public body in the state to hold a fully electronic meeting without designating a physical meeting location. Uh, the open meeting law does require when you don't have that temporary authority that a public body uh, designate a physical location where either a member of the body or a staff member is present and where the public can access and participate in the electronic meeting. That was suspended because of the uh, close personal contact prohibitions that came out uh, in the spring. Um, then the General Assembly went on to allow electronic posting of notices and agendas and some other minor alterations to essentially allow fully electronic meetings. In the codification that is in front of you, uh, you are setting up the automatic trigger for all of those provisions to happen again. So this section starts by defining what an affected public body is. An affected public body is any body whose regular meeting location is located in an area affected by a hazard and that cannot meet in a physical meeting location due to a declared state of emergency. Uh, last year, a lot of questions came up about what a hazard is. Hazard is defined here as in all hazards as the term is defined in Title 20 to bring everyone back to the discussions that happened in the fall. And all hazard covers natural disasters, 
public health emergencies, nuclear war, uh, insurrection, and other significant events such as chemical spills. Let your imagination run wild about what a significant event requiring a declared state of emergency might be. Uh, these first sections allow during sorry, a declared- sorry. Madam Chair, may I ask yes. a question? I, I don't know if you can see me. I don't- Yes. Okay. Um, so this does not let, let's say there was a severe ice storm and a town had to make, the select board had to make a decision, but nobody could get to town hall. It wasn't necessarily, a, an, uh, there wouldn't necessarily be a declared state of emergency in that particular town. How could a town use this when it isn't a state, you know, isn't statewide? The but answer is they could not. To happen. The answer is that this section and the bill is, uh, it was introduced by the committee last session, doesn't address that issue. This is really only about when the governor declares a state of emergency for the whole state or a region of the state, perhaps a particular municipality. Um, in the event that there is some sort of localized significant event and the governor has not declared a state of emergency, the answer would be that the municipality would likely cancel their meeting and post a notice for a future meeting potentially in a different location. Uh, or there are other provisions that allow, for example, you can cancel your regular meeting and announce an emergency meeting in its place uh, have an electronic meeting with a designated physical meeting location that is elsewhere, but that you have made a press release about so the public is aware of where they have to go. I think the, the hope of this was not to deal with every, every emergency that might happen in one town and not someplace else, but more, more regional or statewide ones and ones that would really prohibit um, meeting. If there's an ice storm, in um, Brookfield and it, 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 nobody can get to their meeting, my guess is they'll cancel their meeting. They're not going to um, that night set up for a, a remote meeting. If the ice storm remains for three weeks, perhaps the governor declares a state of emergency in Brookfield. It doesn't right. have to be statewide. Uh, I, I, I hear you, but I can also see something that would require an emergency meeting that, that there might be a hazard that would occur, an emergency in a community or in a region where it hadn't yet been declared an emergency, but they had to meet to make decisions about something important that was pressing. Anyway, I, I, I can see, uh, anyway, I just, it's, this is great. And I know we did this last year. I just, as we have thought further about it, I just am trying to think, as flexible, giving towns as much flexibility as possible. Well, we should definitely, um, as we go through this bill more, we'll hear from uh, the league about whether they have some suggestions about that. Yeah. Okay. All right, Tucker. Subsection B allows during this declared state of emergency, first for the public body to meet without designating the physical meeting location. It suspends the requirement that a staff member or a member of the public body be present. And it allows the uh, public body to place their notices in electronic locations in lieu of designated physical locations. And remember, that is a specific requirement for municipal public bodies. So municipal public bodies under the open meeting law have to post their uh, notices in two physical locations in the municipality. So there are some requirements if the affected public body is gonna meet electronically. Uh, first, the body is required to use technology that permits the attendance and participation of the public through electronic or other means. This is a change that was made from the temporary COVID bills, which only required that the technology permit attendance. Um, the request was that, you know, the technology should also allow participation of the members of the public who are attending. Whenever feasible, the public should be able to access by telephone. And uh, finally, and this is another change from the temporary um, COVID open meeting law provisions that are in play right now, 
They're required to post information that enables the public to directly access and participate in meetings electronically. And they shall include this information in the published agenda for each meeting. So uh, if this were codified and moved forward, the requirement would be if you're holding an electronic meeting, part of your agenda, you have to provide direct access to the public so that they can participate in the meeting electronically. And the discussions that you all had around this was posting, for example, the Zoom link that would allow the public to access the Zoom meeting. Uh, unless unusual circumstances make it impossible for them to do so, uh, each municipality and school board shall record any electronic meeting that is held. Um, so could I go back one, one second here? I'm thinking about this um, and I know we'll get more into detail about it, but in terms of Allison's question, we, we at one point, we have a paper mill um, a, right downtown Putney, right in the smack dab in the center of the village. And we, um, a couple of years ago had a, a huge um, chemical spill and chemical fire there. And so no one was allowed into the, into the village proper. It was all closed off. If the select board had been having, if they had had to have a meeting to deal with something as a result of that fire, they couldn't have gotten to town hall. Could they then post an emergency, um, uh, an emergency meeting and have had it at the central school, which is outside of the village proper and and somebody would have been there. I, I mean, there are ways of dealing with those kinds of emergencies right now, right? So the answer is that they could hold an emergency meeting where they put in the notice for that meeting the specific um, issues that they're gonna be dealing with, which may be a response right. to this particular emergency and they could designate a physical meeting location where okay. public access is possible. Okay, great, that's what I thought, thank you. Uh, last piece that uh, the public body of a municipality is required under these provisions to continue to post notices and agendas near the municipal clerk's office and then uh, to provide each notice or agenda to the newspapers of general circulation for the municipality. And in case uh, any of you are unfamiliar, each municipality has to designate the newspapers of general circulation within the town where certain notices must be posted. So we'll move on to two sections about quasi-judicial proceedings. The reader assistance heading says municipal quasi-judicial proceedings, but there is one state level quasi-judicial proceeding that you all worked on and that is included here. Um, so the first section amends the Title 32 provisions around inspections uh, pursuant to a grand list appeal of a property. To bring you all back to the work that you did, this issue was around in-person inspections of property. Um, the listers, the Board of Civil Authority, whoever's performing this sort of inspection, um, was required to perform an in-person inspection of the property if uh, requested by the property owner. And the issue that came up during COVID, again, was that uh, these municipal officers did not want to be in and around the homes of individuals who are requesting this appeal. So uh, the provisions would suspend during the state of emergency, the requirement for an in-person appeal and would provide the property owner with the right to request an inspection through electronic means. So first, you know, the municipality would suspend its in-person inspections. The property owner would then have the opportunity to say, no, I want an inspection, perform it through electronic means and then uh, the property owner would have to facilitate that and the two parties would carry on. This same opportunity is given to hearing officers um, who perform the next level of um, appellate inspection. Section four, 
dealing with the temporary moratoria on water service disconnections. This is an issue that you just discussed. Uh, it affected municipalities um, primarily because it uh, prevented any utility provider uh, for water or sewer services from shutting off those services during uh, the declared state of emergency. The provisions that you put together here are a bit different. It maintains that any provider of these services shall not disconnect services during the declared state of emergency, provided that first, the state of emergency is declared in response to an all hazard that will cause financial hardship and the inability of ratepayers to pay for water or sewer services. This is one area that the committee focused on. They did not want to apply this to all, all hazards that could come up or all states of emergency. It would only be those that will cause financial hardship and the inability to pay. Um, and two, that the all hazard does not require the water or sewer service provider to disconnect services in order to protect the health and safety of the public. So you didn't want to create a situation where there's a declared state of emergency and um, the water has to be cut off because there's contamination in the water, right? You didn't want to set up a moratorium on water service disconnections that would get people sick. Uh, the other addition that you made um, beyond what is in play right now with the temporary moratorium that's in place is that this provision states that a ratepayer shall remain obligated for any amounts due to a water or sewer service provider that is subject to the section. And uh, you put in a 90 day window for the ratepayer to make those payments. Section five, you took some pieces of the uh, temporary authority for municipal deadline extension and here you add them to the uh, Title 20 declared state of emergency chapter. This states that um, during a state of emergency, a municipal corporation um, may extend any statutory deadline applicable to municipal corporations, provided that the deadline does not relate to a license permit program or plan that is issued or administered by the state or the federal government and they may extend or waive deadlines applicable to those licenses, permits, applications, what have you that are issued by the municipal corporation. So you looked at the window of authority that municipal corporations have around deadlines and certain licenses, permits, and programs. If there is a declared state of emergency in the future, municipalities would have the authority temporarily to extend deadlines and to uh, continue the effectiveness of licenses, permits, and plans uh, up to 90 days after the date that the emergency ends. So the final piece here is a repeal of uh, the statute related to town highway funds. To bring you all back to the discussions that you had, under current law, 19 VSA section 312, town highway funds have to be kept separate and segregated from general funds. There's to be no commingling of funds at all. You granted, we don't want co -mingling. you granted temporary authority during the year 2020. So we're already past the point of uh, the effectiveness of that temporary authority um, for municipalities to move town highway funds to their general fund <laughs> or to move general funds to their highway funds. You weren't sure where the gaps were gonna be during the COVID response. Um, under that temporary authority, all of the money had to be paid back and the funds had to be made whole by the end of 2021. Um, here, you're just repealing that prohibition. This is not contingent on a declared state of emergency. This would be a permanent change Moving forward, you are lifting the requirement that those funds be segregated, which brings me to the last point in my portion of the discussion. That particular section, that repeal, has a different effective date. 
which requires some explanation. That repeal is gonna take effect July 1st, 2021. And the idea of having that as the effective date uh, separate from the other parts that will take effect on passage um, was that July 1st for most municipalities is the start of the next fiscal year. And I'll bring you back and hand this off to Amron. Thank you, Tucker. For the record, Amron Abergele, Office of Legislative Counsel. I'm going to be walking through some of the sections of this bill that cover professional regulation before moving on to um, one last section on uh, reserve funds for the sheriffs. So section seven here, and I will, I will note that uh, this actually, it says three VSA section 138. It's actually going to be 139. Um, there will be a 138 that was already adopted last year in the OPR bill that will become effective on July 1st. So we're gonna update this to say uh, section 139. And the first few um, provisions we have in here about professional regulation are about extension of licenses and um, practicing uh, without a license for a temporary period of time. So once again, this is only during a declared state of emergency. The director, the director, and in this case, we're talking about the director of the Office of Professional Regulation, may extend up to 90 days at a time the expiration dates of current licenses to practice a profession attached to the Office of Professional Regulation. Um, and the director could also waive any associated fees for license renewal that would otherwise apply. Moving on to page 10. <clears throat> this provision, once again, around the Office of Professional Regulation, during a state of emergency, the director may authorize a healthcare professional who practices a profession attached to the office who holds a valid license certificate or registration to provide healthcare services uh, to be deemed a licensed, certified, or registered to provide healthcare services to a patient located in Vermont. And this would be either using telehealth or as part of a staff of a licensed facility. And there are some parameters on here on, I guess I would say safeguards, um, which is that the healthcare professional must be licensed, certified, certified or registered in good standing in whichever jurisdiction that they are presently licensed. They have to not be subject to any professional disciplinary proceedings in any other US jurisdiction. And they cannot be affirmatively barred from practice in Vermont for reasons of fraud or abuse, patient care or public safety. Moving on to page 11. Um, a healthcare professional who's deemed to be authorized under this section will need to submit their name, contact information, and the location or locations where they will be practicing. <clears throat> Anyone who delivers healthcare services under the, uh, pursuant to this section shall be deemed to consent to and be subject to the regulatory jurisdiction of the Office of Professional Regulation. And the authority to practice under this section is going to remain in effect until the termination of the declared state of emergency um, and assuming or and provided that the healthcare professional remains licensed, certified, or registered in good standing. Um, I unfortunately was not here with you all last year, so I don't have as much of the history as Tucker does on his sections. Um, so I will I uh, have to circle back if you have any questions about the history of how we ended up here, unless uh, someone has fresh recollections of what happened last year uh, that prompted these. I'm assuming that, um, well, let, let me just say, should I stop here for questions or continue? Um, I can't see if there are any questions. So if somebody has a question, if they would just pipe up, but I will say that <clears throat> these um, came, the ones cons uh, around health and licensing came either through OPR, the director of OPR, or from uh, the medical board, the executive director of the medical board. So um, that's, that's where they were vetted. So does anybody have a question about this section? No. I don't hear any. Thank you. Um, 
Moving down then to the bottom of page 11 into section nine, this provision governs uh, inactive healthcare professionals being able to practice. This once again is only during a declared state of emergency um, and this authorization must be done in consultation with the Commissioner of Health. The Director of OPR may authorize a former healthcare professional um, who practiced a profession attached to OPR who left active pra practice not more than three years earlier with the individual's Vermont license, certificate, or registration in good standing. Um, to provide health care services to a patient located in Vermont using telehealth or as part of the staff of a licensed facility. Once again, they would need to submit or have submitted on their behalf their name, contact information, and the location um, at which they will be practicing to the Office of Professional Regulation. Moving down on to page 12. Um, the returning healthcare professional is only authorized to provide healthcare services without a license for not more than 30 days. And it must be pending their application for a temporary license. Um, and again, the 30 days is limited to the extent that the director determines whether to issue that individual a temporary license. Um, that is to say that if a professional applies for a temporary license and on day 20 is denied such a license, they would not be able to uh, continue practicing for those additional 10 days to reach the 30 days. It's which, it is whichever comes first, the 30 days or um, the director's determination on their temporary license. And the director may issue a temporary license at no charge and may also impose limitations on the professional scope of practice as the director deems appropriate. Um, any healthcare professional who returns to the healthcare workforce pursuant to this section is going to be subject to the regulatory jurisdiction of OPR. Moving down to section 10. <clears throat> ah, so, once again, during a state of emergency, if the director finds that a board attached to the office cannot reasonably safely um, convene a quorum to transact its business, and if offer, authorized by the Secretary of State, the director may exercise the full powers and authorities of the board, including disciplinary authority. The signature of the director shall have the same force and effect as if voted um, by the board. Moving down to page 13. And then a record of the actions of the director taken pursuant to this authority shall be published conspicuously on the website of the board um, on whose behalf the director took the action. <clears throat> Moving down to section 11. During a state of emergency, the director may issue such orders governing regulated professional activities and practices as, be, as may be necessary to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. If the director finds that a professional practice um, by a person licensed or required to be licensed by the office is exploitative, deceptive, or detrimental to the public health, safety, or welfare, the director may issue an order to cease and desist from the applicable activity. Um, and it's worth noting that the director must have reasonable efforts to publicize or serve the order on the affected persons um, and that a violation of the order shall subject the person or persons to professional discipline, which may be a basis for injunction by the superior court and shall be deemed a violation of section 127 of this subchapter, which is the subchapter on unauthorized practice. Moving on to page 14, we are now shifting into um, sort of companion sections to these prior sections, but in this case, rather than the Office of Professional Regulation, we're talking about regulation through the Board of Medical Practice. So this first section, section 12, um, gives the executive director of the Board of Medical Practice um, the authority to exercise the full powers and authority of the board if it's not safe for the board to reasonably uh, convene a quorum to transact business. The signature of the executive director shall have the same force and effect as a voted act of the board. And once again, a record of the actions of the executive director shall be published conspicuously on the board's website. 
Moving into section 13, um, this is a sort of companion section to earlier, which would authorize the executive director uh, when authorized by the commissioner of health um, to authorize a healthcare professional who practices a profession regulated uh, by the board of medical practice. As, uh, so long as the person holds a valid license, certificate, or registration to provide those health services um, to a patient located in Vermont using telehealth or as part of the staff of a licensed facility. Similar to above, you have the same sort of parameters here, such as the, uh, the professional must be in good standing in the other US jurisdiction where they are licensed or registered or certified. They cannot be subject to any professional disciplinary proceedings in any U.S. jurisdiction, and they cannot be affirmatively barred from practice in Vermont. <clears throat> Once again, the healthcare professional who is authorized under this section must submit to the board the, their name, contact information, and the location um, at which they will be practicing. And a healthcare professional who delivers healthcare services in Vermont pursuant to this section shall be deemed to consent to and be subject to the regulatory jurisdiction of the Board of Medical Practice. Moving on to page 16, uh, the authority to practice under this section shall remain in effect until the termination of the declared state of emergency, uh, provided that the healthcare professional remains licensed, certified, or registered in good standing. Section 14 is again a companion uh, section from above, this time again for the Board of Medical Practice. Um, when authorized by the Commissioner of Health, the Executive Director may authorize a former healthcare professional who practice a profession regulated by the Board of Medical Practice and who left active practice not more than three years earlier against the same time limit as you saw above, um, with the individual's Vermont license certificate or registration in good standing, um, may provide health care services to a patient located in Vermont, again, using telehealth or as part of a licensed uh, staff of a licensed facility. Once again, they have to submit um, or have submit on their behalf their name, contact information, and location where they will be practicing to the Board of Medical Practice. Once again, they are only authorized to practice without a license for not more than 30 days pending their application for a temporary license or until the executive director determines whether to issue the individual a temporary license, whichever comes first. The executive director may issue a temporary license to such a returning healthcare professional at no charge and may impose limitations on the professional's scope of practice. Um, and that is at the executive director's discretion. And the former healthcare professional who returns to the healthcare workforce under this section shall be subject to the regulatory jurisdiction of the board. I realize I went through that second half a little quickly, but these sections are relatively similar to the first portion. Um, again, the difference being that these are professions governed by the Board of Medical Practice versus OPR. So before I move on to the emergency sheriff funding, are there any questions on those sections? I don't see any hands. Okay, I'll keep going then. So our last section, section 15, is about emergency sheriff funding. And during a declared state of emergency that affects a county, in order to support the emergency needs of that county sheriff uh, due to the emergency, the county's operations reserve funds and capital reserve funds, which are described in a previous uh, section of Title 24, may be allowed to be used for the emergency needs of the sheriff subject to the approval of the assistant judges. You do have a definition in here as to what emergency needs are, which in this case means the needs to respond to the emergency and includes hiring deputies, dispatchers, and other personnel and purchasing equipment and supplies. Moving on to our last page, the funding of these emergency needs under the subsection shall be in addition to the support of the sheriff's department set forth in section 73 of title 24 which sort of lays out the basics of what need, uh, what support the sheriff's office will have. There's then a section on reimbursement. So if a sheriff receives county reserve funds for emergency needs, 
uh, they are required to apply to any applicable resources for emergency relief, uh, such as the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, um, that are known to the sheriff for any allowable reimbursement. Within 30 days of receiving any such allowable reimbursement, the sheriff shall provide those funds to the county in order to reimburse the county for the funds that were allocated under this subsection. Um, and it's important to note that a sheriff shall only be responsible for reimbursing the county an amount equal to the allowable reimbursement the sheriff received under subdivision one of this subsection. Um, in other words, the sheriff shall only be responsible for uh, providing to the county what they are allowed to be reimbursed uh, by the um, resources for emergency relief, such as FEMA. <clears throat> then there's a sunset for this authority. The authority for a sheriff to obtain funding for emergency needs under subsection A shall sunset two weeks after the day the governor terminates the declared state of emergency. And uh, this, the sections that I just covered will also uh, take effect upon passage. Senator White, I think you are on mute. I can't hear you. <laughs> you are right. I was on mute. <laughs> I, was, I was complimenting you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I'm sorry, I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> well done. So, um, committee, I think that uh, what we'll do is just, um, I, I would like, I, there might be other things we want to put in here, and this has not been introduced as a draft yet. I mean, it's, we have the request in, but it might end up being a committee bill, so we can take time to um, put other things in it if we want. What I'd like to do right now is hear from um, <clears throat> David Hurley, he about the um, Board of Medical Practice section and if that has changed in any way or if you still feel comfortable with it. Um, thank you, uh, Senator White and uh, hello and happy Can you day. turn up your um, speaker a little bit? Oh, let me see if I can get this. David, we can hardly hear you. Is that any better? No. No. Oh, Not measurably. Oh, there. Is it better now? Oh. Uh, no. I think that was Senator Collimore. I'm sorry. Let me. Um, I gotta change the microphone. And while David's finding that uh, button to increase his volume, uh, Madam Chair, may we take a, a, a leg break, a body break uh, soon? Yes, I think that what we'll do is um, when we, after we've heard from David, we will then, um, unless there are any other questions about this up to this point, then I think what we'll reschedule this and hear from OPR and uh, the sheriffs and VLCT about it and if there are other issues that we want to add to it. <clears throat> and then we'll take a little break and then hear from emergency management systems. Does that work? Okay. okay. All right, David. Wait, is that better now? Perfect. Okay, good. Um, so thank you. Uh, and uh, I was just saying uh, hello and happy new year. I haven't seen you yet in this new year. Thank and, you. Um, ah! Thank, thank you for inviting me to, to um, give you some feedback on, on this draft. Um, and I apologize, I only had a few minutes to look at it. I got it this afternoon and was in another meeting, but- um, And you know, it is exactly the same as what we passed last year. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and it, um, it looks good on, on um, having had a chance to, to um, look it over again. It's really just some, some technical um, changes that I might mention. Um, and that is on page um, 16 of 18 at the top of the, the page where it says uh, in, in paragraph D, where it says, 
the authority to practice under this section shall remain in effect until the termination of the declared state of emergency and provided the healthcare professional remains licensed, certified, or registered in good standing. I think it might be improved by changing it um, to say something to the effect of uh, remains licensed, certified, or registered um, in at least one jurisdiction and in good standing in all jurisdictions we're still licensed. So because people, you know, we have a lot of our licensees are licensed in multiple states and they may, um, they may let a license drop uh, and, and really, you know, but what we care about is they have at least one state where they are licensed uh, and they're not in bad standing anywhere. You know, haven't had something yep. come up. So. Um, and really that's, that's the only um, technical issue I, I had with it. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you, uh, generally going back to the provisions about being able to hold um, remote meetings during an emergency that's been critical for us to continue operations. And um, it's, it's working. I, I think uh, we haven't had any complaints from the public. We've had contested hearings. Um, we've, we've, you know, everything from uh, small committee meetings that are mostly executive session to, to contested uh, uh, hearings on, on uh, charges and it's, it's worked just fine. Great, that's good to hear, thank you. Any questions for David? I think, um, Amarin, we might want to run that change that David just made, run it by um, Lauren Hibbert also to see if that makes more sense to put in their section also. That makes sense, I will make a note. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, David, for joining us. Oh, well, thank you for having me. All right. Good to hear that the open meeting and the change, those changes were helpful to you also. Okay, great. Thank great. You. It's good to see you. Good to see you all. All right. Let us hear about um, EMS. What worked? What didn't work? What do we need to do? Where do we go from here? Um, and <coughs> I believe that um, I don't know if you all yet have met um, Amber and I believe you are um, our contact on this issue. Is that right? Um, or is it Tucker? Which I'm ashamed Emergency to say, I don't know what we're taking up right now. <laughs> Emergency management. Uh, yes, I believe that would be me. Okay. So for those of you who haven't yet met Amarin, Amarin is our new Betsy Ann Rask. So you will soon meet the people here who are to, here to talk to us about emergency management systems, what worked, what didn't work, what they need us to do now. Um, it's an issue we've been trying to address for the last few years and I think have made some, some progress. And I understand that Dan, you have um, this uh, time constraint. And so we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, and we uh, have a new committee member here. I'm sorry I didn't um, acknowledge that right away. For those of you who don't know, Senator Keisha Rahm is now with us from Chittenden County. Okay. All right. Well, well thank you, Madam <laughs> Chair. And uh, Senator, it's, uh, Senator Rahm, it's very nice to meet you. Um, I'm Dan Batey, and I am formerly the EMS chief for the Department of Health. Uh, uh, in August, I was promoted to Director of Emergency Preparedness. So uh, I'm gonna be ceding this role over to a gentleman named William Moran. Uh, he'll be with you, I'm sure, at some point along the journey. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best today to, uh, to fill his shoes. Um, I, I first wanted to say thank you very much because uh, the efforts that you all put forth uh, last year really were greatly successful. Uh, and just to give you the highlights, um, the, the, the major success was around tuition uh, uh, voucher systems that we put into play. Uh, as most of you remember, uh, you gave us a, a pot of money for both paramedics and for uh, everyone else. So EMTs, advanced EMTs, uh, and emergency medical responders. 
uh, we had overwhelming success in both of those pools. Um, we put uh, we, we completely filled all of our resources, so we used all the all the funding. Um, uh, we put 39 new paramedics into uh, the paramedic programs that are, are associated with Vermont EMS. Um, that is probably double what we normally would do in a given year, uh, and uh, that's really remarkable. And I would say that if we had uh, twice as much money, we would have put twice as many students in uh, under those circumstances because we were turning people away by the time we were, were finished. Um, uh, we have more work to do in that, including uh, trying to get a handle on the cost of paramedic programs and VTC and working with them. And they've been great partners in this, uh, but uh, overwhelming success on the, on the paramedic side. And that's going to lead us to a heck of a lot more advanced life support providers uh, roaming the streets of Vermont here in another few months. So uh, really great. Uh, in the I'm other not sure I'd use the term roaming the streets, but <laughs> I know, yeah, sorry. <laughs> a little too colloquial there. Um, uh, in the other pot of money, uh, we put uh, 313 additional providers uh, into class seats. Uh, and these are all, remember, these are all active providers in Vermont. Uh, so, so in order to be eligible for tuition voucher, you had to be... Um, uh, approved by a service chief. So these aren't just students at Middlebury and UVM taking a class because they want to go to a PA school or a medical school. These are, are, are folks who are actively on a roster. We put 313 uh, into programs. And again, uh, we used up all the funding. So who knows where it would have gone if we had more. Um, and just to put that in perspective, uh, on a given year, uh, I'll take you back our last three years. In the last three years, we put on average in a year about 400 new licenses every year. Um, and to get to that number, we have to train about 600. So, so again, that 600 number accounts for the students that are moving out of state and don't really ever intend to be in an ambulance. So, in, 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 in remember, we had this, we, we received this money in August with a, a November deadline to finish it. So in, in three months, we put nearly half as many people as we ordinarily would in a full year into our EMS system. So that is really a remarkable feat. And um, what it demonstrates to me at least is that we do have a financial barrier to bringing people into the system. Uh, and you know, when I, when I think about how we plan ahead and what are the things that we need to be looking forward to, what, what, I, what it makes me realize is if we intend to keep a volunteer EMS system, at least in partially uh, a, a volunteer nature, we've got to think about what that financial barrier is, because clearly there's people who want to come in who, if given the financial resources to do it, will enter our system. So, uh, uh, but that's for future planning, but I, I do want to say thank you because this has been a great boon. And, and also keep in mind, we did this during a global pandemic when two thirds of our educational programming were shut down. There were no, for, for the entire period of enrollment, there was no classes going on at UVM. There were no classes going on at Middlebury and those account for almost half of our students in a given year. So, you know, this is really something uh, that, that has been facilitated through your efforts. And uh, uh, it's, been, it's been great. It really has been a terrific boon. Um, we've also made significant progress with some of the other elements. Uh, we've had some, some great uh, uh, meetings moving forward, looking at um, uh, uh, competency and portfolio-based testing. I think we will have a, 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 a meaningful plan in place here very soon. Uh, you'll hear from Pat uh, um, a, li a little bit later today. Um, there's a very high likelihood that we'll have a pilot project with his program coming up. Again, I don't want to put him on the spot because there's still some work to do, but we've got, we've got a good concept in mind. And I think it's uh, something that will, will be a, a, an innovative uh, way to get people into our system coming up. Um, and then we've still got a lot of work to do. We've still got to work on uh, how to sort out the other uh, uh, levels of instructor. We still got to work out how to, um, sort out the, the new uh, emergency responder level, uh, Vermont first responder level. Um, 
and that's a, that's a challenge, right? We're, we're juggling a lot of, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of balls in the air at the department of health right now, but, but again, we've got good contributions from the, um, from the advisory committee. We've got good contributions, good people working on it. So I think we're going to be in very good shape, uh, come time to report back to you. Great. That, that, that is fantastic. That is great. And as we go forward, I would love for you all to think about um, what, as we look at new CARES money coming in, to look at what might be a reasonable um, amount to devote to, to the training aspect. So, um, and you don't have to have any answers today, but I do know that um, <clears throat> the, uh, the Appropriations Committee is asking us to, to look at that. And I think it would be very helpful if we had some real numbers and then this great information here to back up those, yeah. those numbers. Well, so. Senator, I think, I think we certainly have a model that will inform us on this. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we, we, we've certainly been looking at a lot of the data behind it. Um, and I'm happy to share any and all of that information. Um, so, so I think I think we've got good fodder for conversation at least around this. Good, Senator Clarkson. So, thank you, Dan. That is that's you know it's just great to know when things worked and that money was well used. And uh, I'm glad you didn't return any of it. Um, I'm glad you used it all up. Um, I guess I would uh, uh, wonder going forward. I am hoping we will be able to uh, appropriate significant money from the state it, it, with any stimulus bill that comes from the Biden-Harris uh, 1.9 trillion they've talked about. I would assume that there would be some EMS uh, kinds of money that we could direct to, to booting up and really getting uh, e the EMS systems booted up, you know, staffed up fully in the state or at least partially staffed up. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm living in hope that we can continue this work with a so, big money injection. I have. I did write um, a note to uh, VTC to the president and asked her about the tuition difference and why why there would be such an amazing tuition difference and what and she did respond to me. But I um, am going to ask her to come in the next time we get more into detail on in this area about why there's such a discrepancy between it and the amount at GCC because um, that's Greenfield Community College for those of you who don't live on the border. Um, <clears throat> so uh, she, we will ask her to come in and, and talk to us about why that difference exists. President Mullen has been a, a really excellent partner in this, uh, so I want to I want to thank her as well. Yeah. Um, she's been creative, and and we had to go through several degrees of administrative machinations to to find a way to appropriately fund these paramedics that are going through. She's been a terrific partner. Um, I think she's anxious to answer that question as well, um, and and we're anxious to help her navigate this as also. So whatever resources we can bring to bear, including, you know, numerous connections to other college systems and other programs in other states. We're happy to help however we can. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions for Dan? Senator Polina? Hey, could you just remind me about what the cost is per student? I forget. I remember, I don't remember there was a big difference between GCC and BTC, yeah. but remind me what the cost, what we're talking about per student. Yeah. So it's been it's been a, about probably a year. Drew, do you have better information than I do? Yeah, Drew. And there are two different programs too: the, the provider one and the paramedic one. Right. Yeah, I do have some um, data about the cost of all of the paramedic programs in New England that I did um, after Senator White has kind of sent me a request for some research. So I do have that for you. I don't know if you want those numbers now or you want me to wait until later to present that. Well, maybe just, um, I think Anthony, Senator Polina's question was, we talked about the tremendous difference between GCC and VTC. And if you just throw that out, then we can get more into sure. the other yeah, I just don't, I just don't, re I just don't so, remember the numbers. I'm curious. So uh, Greenfield Community College is a certificate program, a uh, 20 month program uh, with a total cost 
of $9,000 that's cost in fees. And uh, VTC is also a 20 month certificate program. And the total cost in fees is between 32 and 34,000. Pretty big difference. Oh my, that's Senator huge. Rahm. <laughs> Senator Rahm. Um, I don't know if this is off, top, off topic, but I thought it was appropriate for Dan. Um, I've just been following uh, some language at the federal level about trying to make grants and supports available for mobile vaccine units to make sure we get out to our transportation um, barrier folks. Um, and I just wondered if you all are following that. I know there's certain temperature requirements and things like that, but I wondered if, if you've been seeing if that's something we can put together for places like the Northeast Kingdom. Yeah, Senator, we're not only following it, we're leading the way. Um, EMS in Vermont uh, has shouldered a tremendous burden uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, it started with testing uh, and we've supported our, our mobile testing efforts since the beginning. Um, and we are about to kick off uh, what will be really an unprecedented effort using EMS in Vermont to reach vulnerable populations. In fact, uh, I'll, 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 I'll make a specific note of Drew and Rescue Inc. They're partnering right now with Wyndham County Home Health uh, to reach uh, uh, homebound folks uh, and they're ready to kick that off next week. I, I haven't heard of any other state in the union that's as aggressive and ready to go as we are in this field. Um, we know that there's gonna be a tremendous need for a lot of different vulnerable populations. Uh, we've talked to stakeholders from uh, houseless uh, citizens to uh, assisted living centers, to uh, migrant workers. We've been, we've been chatting with lots of people. Um, of course, it's mitigated by vaccine supply. So we're gonna start off slow and build capacity as we go on. But uh, to answer your question, absolutely. And uh, EMS will, will, will lead the way in that regard. Thank you. And I, I just will say um, two things here and then we can go to Drew. I will say for Senator Rahm's um, information here that we probably have the most incredible EMS system in the country and they have been, they have responded, well, even before the pandemic hit, they were, they responded and took care of our citizens in really incredible ways. And since the pandemic has hit, we, we should be very proud of them in all areas of, of their response. And then I would like to just before uh, we go to Drew, ask Dan how he likes his new job and would he just much prefer to be back with us in on EMS? Well, uh, I'll, I'll let you know when I actually do my real job. <laughs> I've still been doing this pandemic response, you know, 12 hours a day for the last year. Um, but, you know, it was a great opportunity for me. And, 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 and since my division oversees EMS, you'll still, uh, see my hand in the mix. I, I'm not ready to fully give it up yet, um, but uh, it's going to be a different, a different, uh, a different gig. Okay, good. Well, I didn't expect you to answer whether you really wanted to be back. <laughs> but are are you replacing the woman who runs emergency uh, response now? No, I think you're talking about Director Borneman over at uh, yeah. Vermont Emergency Management. I'm replacing Chris Bell, uh, who was the division director of the, the Division of Emergency Response Preparedness and Injury Prevention. <coughs> okay, well, thank you for joining us. And I know that you have some time constraints and so we'll probably be leaving us at some point, but we appreciate it. And we will be continuing this conversation because we wanna make sure that we're doing everything and not just in response to um, money or the pandemic, but if there are other things that we need to that we need to be addressing for our EMS system, we will we will be continuing the conversation. So yeah, and and thank, thank you all again. You've been tremendous partners in this effort, and uh, uh, we really appreciate it. Well, I can tell you, um, Drew has uh, for the last four years been. Um, I was going to say a pain in my side, but I won't say that. He has been persistent in um, in his needs. So, thank you. It's the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me. <laughs> Thanks, Drew. Dan, Dan, good luck as you <laughs> transition. Good luck. All right, Drew. Would you like to? 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, Dan got to steal the thunder there a little bit and talk about kind of the success that we've had um, with implementation to of uh, kind of our education program. Um, I guess I'll just kind of add a little bit to that. Um, you know, we talked early in the uh, spring, which uh, seems like, uh, you know, several years ago at this point, but um, about the, the uh, reduction in uh, total transports that um, had an effect on the kind of the financial status of a lot of ambulance services because uh, remember, we are only paid to uh, to move people. We're not actually paid to deliver healthcare currently. Uh, something I, I think we should we should probably talk about yep. in the future. But as a result of that transport loss, um, there was um, significant concern about uh, ambulance services that were not going to be able to um, stay viable. And as part of the um, CARES appropriation, there was a um, nine hundred thousand um, dollar ambulance stabilization grant that did go out. So with the help of the uh, agency human services and the, uh, some federal funding, um, we're, we're doing pretty well in Vermont. We have not lost ambulance services as a result of, of lost revenue this year, which is uh, certainly a better position than I thought we were gonna be in uh, in March in that um, kind of lost revenue assistance we got through the uh, ambulance stabilization grant was, was a huge help. Um, we did have, like Dan said, some significant uh, success in um, standing up um, a completely new style of EMS program. So for many years, um, 50 years, EMS education has been uh, in person. It's been, you know, a typical kind of two night a week schedule. It's um, kind of had this very historical uh, existence. And given the, the pandemic and given the need to shut down education programs in the spring, in the spring to prevent the spread of uh, COVID, uh, we needed to come up with something completely new. So not only did we kind of get that done during the pandemic, but we kind of re redesigned it. And in uh, the fall, we kicked off hybrid programs around the state, which are allowing us to uh, reach people that we weren't able to reach before. Uh, last year, when we were, I was testifying with this committee, we talked about some pilot programs that we had run in our region down here in southern Vermont, um, looking at expanding our access to education for the volunteers and smaller communities through um, technology. And, you know, as, as we sit here on Zoom today, we're certainly understanding some of the advantages, though I'm not sure they're all advantages, but some of the advantages in our ability to reach um, people that we couldn't reach before. So we did get um, overwhelming response to the uh, the voucher program. Um, we have a lot of data and a lot of in, uh, information, um, a lot of education on what we can do with uh, EMS education programs that have financial support. Um, when you you know asked about what can we what has worked, I would say that what we did has certainly worked. When you asked about what we need to think about doing, um, especially as we look at maybe additional COVID uh, funds is to continue to build a sustainable system. So this year we managed to stand up some programs. We've learned a lot, but I don't know that we've built um, sustainability into the program. Um, we hopefully at the end of um, these classes, which again, we got started much later than our typical um, kind of class schedule uh, we're going to have some new people in our workforce, but we're still going to be short. Um, usually we have spring classes and fall classes. That's kind of the typical EMS pattern. Uh, we didn't do that. We kind of started late fall. So these classes are going to be ending over the next couple months. Um, so we've learned a lot from those classes, but what we need to be thinking about as we kind of work forward through uh, what funds might be available is how to get additional people into this workforce and build a sustainable um, education model. So kind of going down that path, we made, I think, some, some huge steps in that direction last year in legislation by addressing the instructor coordinator, um, the advisory committee, um, and through the education council that was created, has uh, four working groups now that are 
taking on those topics of uh, EMS instructor coordinator uh, credentials, uh, portfolio-based testing, the development of the Vermont responder, which is, a, is going to be a, a level that will help bring people in, into the EMS system and increase our overall uh, workforce. Drew, so do you got, want to just explain what that level is to uh, Senator Rahm because she was not aware of that? Yeah, so this is a, uh, a new level of uh, licensure that we're going to be offering in Vermont, which will allow people that have uh, the skills to provide life-saving life interventions. Uh, for example, a, uh, in a lot of areas, it would be a, a fireman or a, um, a police officer that has first aid, CPR, uh, bleeding control, and Narcan administration training to be part of the EMS system and be able to be, uh, respond to those calls. So for our smaller services, um, volunteers that have limited um, availability for training, this is a way that they can get the life-saving skills they need uh, to help in their community. So uh, we have uh, some areas, I can say right here in, you know, in our area, Wyndham County, where the entire first response workforce is now falling on one or two people. Um, that responsibility is huge. And by adding these Vermont responders, they'll be able to, in some cases, increase their workforce by tenfold um, by bringing on a lot more a lot more hands. So it's pretty exciting, especially to our first responders uh, that, are, that are trying to get this work done. Um, so, and Dan kind of touched on some of the other interesting uh, things that have happened to EMS over the, the last, you know, six or seven months. Um, we've been plugged into some of the uh, pandemic related challenges, um, everything from initially setting up testing sites and working with the uh, regional health departments to or health offices to do their testing, to in-home testing for homebound people. Um, we've been involved in um, transportation of uh, non-medically necessary um, COVID positive or COVID suspected patients so that we can help to uh, eliminate the associated um, risk of putting them into um, housing units like uh, homeless shelters. So, for example, in our area, if a um, if there's a potential exposure of a um, homeless person, um, those people are are transported by EMS to a, a shelter where they can be monitored and uh, wait out their quarantine periods. So we've taken on um, all kinds of uh, roles so far, and the most recent role that uh, EMS is gonna be undertaking is this, um, this massive effort of vaccinating the entire uh, public, um, a role that uh, EMS is you know, excited to participate in. And I know we have services around the state that are, are working to uh, you know, put their plans together and we'll be supporting the health department in that, in that realm. Um, down here in, in um, our area, we're working with Dan and his office, as well as the uh, visiting nurses, and we're going to be starting uh, home visits um, next week for those people that are unable to get to um, vaccine clinics so that we can get some of the most vulnerable people in our community vaccinated as quickly as we can. Uh, Senator Clarkson? Drew, it's great to see you. Um, so does that mean that's a partnering, that's a big partnering effort with our long-term care facilities, our, our senior centers, that, to identify that population for you? You must be partnering with a huge group of organizations to do that. Yeah, the collaboration that's happening right now in the um, kind of the healthcare arena is, is amazing. Um, we've seen for many years silos uh, in different kind of sectors of, of healthcare, as well as different sectors of um, emergency services. And if the pandemic's done anything, it's really kind of torn down those, those silos and everybody is really pushing forward to um, kind of the end goal of getting people vaccinated. So yeah, these are huge partnerships and um, the, the cooperation has been excellent. The working with the health um, department has been super easy and certainly other than, you know, Dan's daily call to tell us that he needs us to pull just a little bit more, uh, a little bit more weight, um, which we're glad to do. Um, you know, it, it's been a, a pretty um, 
stressful but seamless uh, pandemic for EMS. So I'm, I'm just going to throw this out that that was very interesting that you talked about tearing down the silos because this morning or right, right before this, we heard from VLCT. And one yeah. of the positive things that they said came out of this pandemic was <clears throat> the tearing down of silos, that they felt that there was better communication between state agencies and between state agencies and them and the ability to communicate and respond. So that is something that we really, really need to keep in our heads as we go forward about the systems changes that we need to look at. Yeah. Okay, Senator Rom, did you have a question? Yeah, kind of along the same lines of just hearing about this extra level of training, which sounded like it was related to opioid issues, et cetera. I, I've just been following for a while experiences in places like Lisbon, Portugal and West Virginia, where they have mobile um, medication assisted treatment. Um, and that helps you know people drive by on their way to work or something if it's more convenient for them or you know, go somewhere where there's, you know, there's a high population of people who need that service. Um, is that something that you all have given any thought, which might be an interesting way to sort of study the partnerships that are needed to be made for the vaccine, although different age groups and sort of transition to having mobile MAT available to people? Um, I think that I'm going to let Drew respond, but I think that the MAT probably is more in the jurisdiction of the health committee and through the Department of Health, other programs rather than EMS. Um, but I'll let Drew respond to that. So I believe we're going to be moving into the area of uh, mobile vaccination. So as we work our way through the, the kind of the vaccine process, I can definitely see um, uh, mobile distribution sites uh, being set up around in some of those areas. Um, as, a, as a way to reach more of the public. Um, Dan is the expert on how that's going to happen, but I, I think you'll see um, those vaccine clinics moving to locations where people are. I mean, it might be that, Senator Rahm, it might be that <clears throat> the lessons learned from how we um, do the mobile vaccine units could be applied to other areas of health delivery but that wouldn't be through the EMS system. It, it, if it's going to be permanent, it shouldn't be through the EMS system is my feeling. But Dan, you just muted yourself. Sorry about that. Um, so, so we actually have looked at mobile, uh, MAT. Um, New Jersey is a good example of EMS using it. Um, when, we, when we applied their model to our system, the challenge in New Jersey was that it wasn't available in lots of places. Here in Vermont, we had such good access in the emergency rooms that it wasn't a significant, I'm not saying there isn't a need, but there wasn't as much of a need comparatively. Uh, so at that point, we kind of said, maybe we should leave it over there because it's, it's a challenge on the EMS side as well. Um, but I think, I think what, if anything, this pandemic has demonstrated is how good a public health partner EMS is and how important their role is beyond the traditional movement of a patient from one place to another. And, and I think that has really told us that everything should be on the table. Well, one of the things that we've talked about is that when um, the emergency management system was first put into place, it really was thought of as a as transportation. It was a transport system and it wasn't part of our healthcare consciousness and that we've been working really hard in this committee and with health and welfare to try to change that that kind of culture so that EMS really is seen as a healthcare provider and and to that end we need to look at what they can do what they can deliver how they get reimbursed for their the use of their medicines how they get reimbursed for actually serving people and going there instead of just for transporting. So we'll have Corey Gustafson and some other people come in and talk to us about how we might begin to look at, at the reimbursement part of it anyway. Sorry, Drew. Go. Well, that's actually um, the other thing that is, and we knew it in this committee certainly has, uh, we've had this discussion, um, the other thing we, we made very clear early in the pandemic is quite how fragile um, the system is. So it took um, 
about three weeks of uh, reduced call volume before the financial viability of our um, EMS system was in question. So as we, you know, we've talked for quite a few years about how EMS is, is struggling because of the way that we're reimbursing the low reimbursement amounts. Um, it, it was, it was uh, very apparent when you started um, operating in the, in the red just a couple of weeks into the pandemic. So as we kind of move forward away from um, the, the pandemic and we look at uh, the need for uh, EMS and the need for a trained and sustainable workforce, uh, we do know that you know 25% of uh, EMS responders are going to be leaving EMS in the next year. That's what our data says. We've surveyed um, our workforce. We know that a large percentage of those are leaving EMS as a result of um, the wages in EMS. Um, so what we're asking of our EMS providers um, is huge. Um, just to put it into perspective, um, the EMTs that we are going to be um, sending to people's homes to vaccinate, observe for life-threatening complications um, on a daily basis, make between $13 and $15 an hour. Um, that's something that, you know, moving forward, we're going to need to uh, address. Yeah. And if the reimbursement rate was different <clears throat> and how you were reimbursed and what you were reimbursed for, it would help in that. So, Absolutely. Senator Clarkson. So on the workforce <clears throat> development uh, issue, I'm just curious, Drew, we've discussed this for years, like the number of people you train, you invest in them, and then they leave for various reasons. I'd like to know if some of them, if we can look at EMS as part of the ladder into healthcare uh, professionals. I mean, is it, you know, nurses have a very well-defined ladder in workforce development. Do we, could we better employ EMS as part of a ladder of a bigger system? And um, instead of looking at it as a detriment to EMS, but really looking at it as a workforce development partner with then the next certificate program and the next training and maybe getting them to medical school. That's, that's one question. And I have another one. I can speak to that um, with my, um, you know, my personal experience here in our workforce is um, definitely that EMS providers uh, quite often are stepping their way into um, other healthcare careers. It's a way to uh, see if you are interested in the healthcare uh, environment and you know, this year alone, we've lost um, two providers to uh, PA school. Uh, we've lost three providers to emergency uh, room uh, positions, uh, though they're still working as, uh, at their EMS level, they're working in a hospital-based um, type system. Um, I've trained, and, and I like to point out that I've trained uh, five doctors um, that I now get the pleasure of working for. So it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it is definitely a career ladder. Well, and that's great. And the question I think we have for EMS is then how do we better use that to then let them evangelize the value of, star, of so that we make it more of a, 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 a feed, so that it feeds you, so that we help make them be, you know, advocates for coming in and beginning at using that as an entry point for the healthcare system. You see what I mean? I mean, how can we better employ them to help us? So I think there's there's a couple different things that are kind of playing out. And one is people are moving from EMS to um, other healthcare careers because of the level of reimbursement. Yeah. So a, a right. paramedic makes roughly half of what a nurse makes, um, but the scope of practice and the expectations are, are no different. Um, when, when I come to your house and you're suffering a heart attack, um, I think your expectations are pretty high. Yeah. Well, I hope your expectations are pretty high. Um, but yet the, the reimbursement is, is so low on the, the way that we reimburse and the, the calls that do get reimbursed um, that it's very difficult to pay that livable wage to those professionals. So they do move on to other careers. Right, uh, I, I've got that and we've talked about that. Um, I guess um, the, uh, another one of my questions is, 
where are the volunteers? I mean, because when we talk about who, if you are a real mesh of volunteer system, a volunteer system and a paid professional system, and you're right, is paid professionals this is a very low earnings and challenged reimbursements, which we hope will, will get improve. Where are the vo I mean, what do the volunteers get? Do they get paid per call or do they not get paid at all? There are some services that do uh, stipend their volunteers, um, you know, a small amount for travel expenses and, um, and other um, kind of costs. Uh, most of them don't receive any compensation. And those people that are true volunteers in EMS system are what we worked so hard last year at trying to come up with ways to support through the new first responder, through the right. access to um, education. Um, we the cost associated with becoming an EMT at $1,000 a student uh, was in many cases being paid by the volunteer themselves. So most of our kind of legislative effort last year was targeted towards that volunteer support and right. getting the those people access. The Margaret's, um, the Margaret Lagasses of the exactly. world. Exactly. <clears throat> I, think, I think that I would just throw in a thought here that um, while we, it would be nice to have people be able to see it as a, a, a ladder, a career ladder, we also don't want to keep the EMS providers so underpaid that they have to go through for a career. They're, we need to keep good people in our EMS system. We need to pay them to stay there, not to, not to look elsewhere because they can't afford to remain there. And there are many of them are doing much the same, the same things in their new jobs but they're being paid better. So we, we really need to look at how we keep people in our EMS system. And if that's, I am sure it's more than just pay, but that's a huge one. Yeah, no, it, it agreed. So um, Drew, do you have more that you wanna tell us today? Um, the only other thing I'll, you know, just, you know, from the experience um, and we're still facing this uh, hesitation of people going to the hospital. So uh, just as mm -hmm. a piece of information, uh, early on in the pandemic, we told everybody that um, the entire uh, public that if you're not dying, uh, do not go to the hospital, um, which is, um, it's interesting to see what happens when you, you know, tell people not to go to the hospital. They actually listened. Uh, we had people that were actively having strokes and heart attacks that are like, I don't wanna go to the hospital. They told us not to go unless we're actually dying. Um, and, and they really did take that public message very seriously. Uh, so we've seen our number of people that are expecting EMS to come to their homes, take care of them and leave them at home for follow-up later uh, increase. Actually in our area has doubled uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, which is kind of an interesting piece of, of data for us um, that, that people are still calling uh, EMS, um, but are really hesitant to go to the, the hospital. Um, so we're seeing more of that home treatment and um, and then them following up later with their, their local uh, primary cares. I don't know that I have uh, anything specific um, as, we guy, as you guys go through your session, I'll be glad to answer questions or I can provide you with the data that we have. I do apologize our legislative report from the advisory committee is going to be a little bit late. Um, we will get no it problem. to you as soon as I can tidy up the uh, last draft. Um, I don't know if Jim has anything else specific he wants to throw in there, but I would like to say thank you for the work that you guys did last year. Uh, we would definitely not be in as good a position as we are this year without that workforce development money uh, and the ambulance stabilization. Um, if we didn't have the ability to pay for those 300 students, um, which we desperately need in our system right now, uh, I'm not sure where we'd be as far as, as far as workforce goes this year. So that was a huge help. Thank you. Jim, did you have anything you wanted to throw in? Oh, uh, you've, you've had some very eloquent speakers. They're telling you how it is. I want to review a few things on behalf of the Vermont Ambulance Association of the Service, which is again, very much thank you. Thank you for the past year's services that you've done for us looking into this. There's nothing that is completely fixed, nothing that 
has been miraculously changed, but without your help, I think we'd be in much, much bigger trouble. I'm very proud uh, of the EMS system that we have. The people are working very hard. Uh, the EMS people are helping in everything they can and they want to, and I'm so proud of them, but your help has been tremendous to us. When they talk about numbers, I just wanna say this problem is not solved. This number of personnel that we need to get into and not to take anything away, the numbers you got for us to get in to paramedic school and to get into EMT school, those numbers are, are still gonna be very hard on us right now and into the future. So when, like Dan said, they have 313 people added through this course in EMTs or 36 paramedics, it's going to be probably another three, four months before even all those can get certified in the, in the EMT. And it's really gonna be a, probably another year and a half to two years before the paramedics become online. This is a very big help, but it's a problem we need to really look into the future. If we can use some, uh, the para, uh, COVID funding to help again this year, that'd be wonderful. But that's my main thing is we need to have personnel and you've touched everything from we have to pay them to keep them. There's so much, but without your help, we would be in a lot worse shape and we thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I do have two two questions um, or two areas that <clears throat> we addressed and I don't quite remember how we in the end left them, but one was the, um, the requirement that the Green Mountain Care Board look at the EMS system when they do their ATRAP, their health resource allocation plan. And I wondered if, <clears throat> if that has happened or if they have done it this year and if they have contacted you to get information. And then the other area is the, um, we were seeing some potential pressure put on the system by um, <clears throat> those private ambulance services who were um, specializing in hospital to hospital transports. Um, and uh, we tried to deal with that around um, cherry picking and telling, saying that if an ambulance service was going to serve in an area or be licensed in an area, they had they couldn't do that. They had to serve the entire population. And I wonder if you can comment on those two areas and if there's been any anything as a result of that. Me? Okay, I'll comment. Or I think either, any, uh, any that, of the that, three of you, just. On the uh, Green Board Mountain Board, they have not contacted us that I know of yet. And I'm sure that everybody, we're very busy, but we're so thankful that we're able to go into that and look forward, but not as of yet. And okay. on the, the transport of the uh, patients, it's a problem hospital to hospital, but we, don't have a method that keeps them out as of yet from the past. But it's all determined about how we can make the system work for everyone within the local means as much as possible. I don't think there's a permanent answer from the past on that. Didn't we put something in there that said that if they're going to be licensed that they have to, they can't cherry pick? I thought we put that in. Dan yeah, you did Drew, add do you that was in the legislation um, the, and those, um, it was a requirement for the health department to implement that as part of a uh, rule. So I'm assuming at this point with everything going on, the rule has not been updated yet. Um, okay. And it is a non-discrimination requirement that needs to be added to the licensure, which would, um, would prevent um, ambulance services from, for example, only taking um, private insurance so if, if I'm only willing to go to the hospital and pick you up if you have insurance, um, uh, I think that's a, a, terrible, um, a terrible system. So um, I can tell you from you know, our perspective, and I'm sure Jim's the same way, uh, we take uh, very good care of the patients that are in our system, that are in our hospitals. And any patient that shows up at one of our two hospitals that needs a higher level of care, whether they have insurance or they don't have insurance, we will make every single effort possible um, to get them to whatever care they need. And as long as I think what you guys did is you kind of leveled the playing field and made that the standard 
um, across the board. So I think that will be helpful once the rules are in place. Okay, Dan, is that the case that it just hasn't happened yet because of everything else? I think you're muted. Yeah, I apologize. Um, uh, so, so I don't know the answer to your question. Uh, and I want to just go back and double check. I don't believe it has. I, I, we've had discussions about rules. And the reason I'm hesitating is I can't remember if the interpretation was that it already existed and we had the capability or if it was something we needed to do. Okay. I'd like to go back and look, though, uh, to be sure. I don't want to give you a, a, a half answer here. OK, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I would like to hear some follow up on that. And and I don't know where the Green Mountain Care Board is in uh, terms of their new HRAP, but if they are working on it and they haven't contacted you, then we need to um, slap their fingers. So, um, and I understand um, that Shayla has taken a new position also, so will not be with us. Is that, am I right about that, Dan? You do like to mute yourself. Yeah, I'm sorry. My dog is eating his dinner uh, literally two feet away from me and it's kind of loud. So uh, oh. um, anyhow, uh, yeah, so Shale has been fully dedicated to the response. Uh, I think she's been moved in sort of a different direction. I, I don't know if, if that will change as things change okay. here, but she certainly has her hand in things as well. So I don't think you've good. seen the last of her. Oh, good. Thanks. So in terms of your dog eating his um, dinner, we had a uh, somebody testifying to us the other day and she, we could hear this little uh, shrieking in the background and her dog was eating her two-year-old daughter's mac and cheese. <laughs> so at least your dog is eating his own dinner. Yeah, well, he's yeah. <laughs> um, anybody else have any questions for uh, Dan or Jim or Drew? No, nope. it's always good to see everybody though. And as we go forward and we have more le any legislation or anything that we need to, to do, Amarin will be working with us and um, She'll be, might be coming to you for more background information on some of the issues. Okay. Um, so I, I see that Gwen is still with us and I just wondered if you wanted to weigh in at all on the EMS issue and how in relation to the towns, because I know in some towns, the EMS system is part of the municipal system. Sorry, I was um, on a call, so I don't I don't okay. know exactly what you want to talk about. So I no, I just wondered. Okay. We were just talking about the EMS system, and I know that in some towns, the EMS system is actually part of the municipal government. Right. And it, and if if you had, we heard here um, some of the positives and negatives, and where we need to go from here. And I just didn't know if you had anything else that you wanted to throw in, or if you wanted to wait till the next time we took it up. I can. I'll, I'll wait. I just know that. I think the the nonprofits, the ones that are, haven't been associated with municipalities, just had a little bit more trouble than than we did because we had direct aid to municipalities. Um, so there was just that extra step that um, was onerous on on those folks, um, which is unfortunate. So I think we were in a little bit better shape at the municipal level. Okay, um, Senator Clarkson. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just curious, Gwen, if you could, when you come back. If you could bring us data about how what percent of the EMS uh, teams uh, are municipal versus uh, nonprofits, and Drew probably has that too, obviously. But it would be great if 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 we could get a better set. I, I mean, you probably have given this to us in the past, but I'm not remembering. Um, so, what percent are municipal? What percent are standalone? What percent are volunteer? What percent are are professional? I think that would help us understand the full universe. And I'm sure you've, sh but I don't have it sort of, I don't. Yeah, Thank you. Drew, maybe or Dan, but I think with the dis like with the different districts, don't they have an inventory of each agency and then you can glean from that yeah. what is what? Yeah. Dan? Uh, we're about to prepare for you something called the stakeholders guide. 
Oh, great. If, we, if we ever get a moment where we can concentrate on something other than COVID-19, uh, it's, it's ready to go. Uh, and um, the challenge has just been that our, so everyone in our communications team is pulled in a thousand directions. But that does contain a lot of that. And uh, uh, I think it would be exactly what you're looking for. So I, I would simply say, stand by, it's coming. Uh, hopefully as soon as we can kind of divert some resources away, we'll have uh, a, a presentation for you all. Thank you. Give me, if you give me so, one second, Dan, I'm looking at the draft, I'll give you the number. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> While you're looking for that, can I ask if this isn't directly related to COVID or where you need to go moving forward, but it seems to me that one of the first things we did um, directly related to EMS in this committee was when we um, re reassigned or the districts there, there was, and there was a, a lot of opposition to it and we did it anyway. Um, and I just wondered if that has worked out. I can't, Brian, do you remember, Sarah Colomer, do you remember exactly what it was we did? No, but I Drew, remember the, I remember the discussion about that, yeah. Drew will remember because he's the one that brought it to us. I hope. But I can't remember the resolution. Well, we changed the, some, for some reason, the membership on the advisory council had uh, did not have a representative from each district. And, um, and we changed that. And I don't remember how we changed it. And I just wonder if the change, whatever we did was a valuable change. Yeah, so I can speak to that. Um, the, the big change was uh, to the EMS advisory uh, committee. So mm -hmm. you restructured that committee and uh, changed the membership um, and also changed how, the, um, how the, the chair of that committee was chosen. It used to be um, that committee was run by the EMS office. Um, yeah. And then up until COVID, um, part of that change was that the EMS um, advisory committee had to move from district to district so that it was accessible to all of the um, kind of the stakeholders, all the EMS groups around the state. Obviously, uh, with with COVID this year, um, that meeting has been virtual for almost a year, um, like everything else. But um, I would say um, that the change has been beneficial. We have um, pretty widespread uh, participation in most of our meetings. Um, I would say that you know we're probably eighty plus percent uh, participation. Um, with people coming to those meetings. Um, the reports and the information that you've been getting from the last uh, three years has been a direct result of the change. So I think uh, you're probably seeing more, um, more accurate, more um, available information on the EMS system than you did before. So, but that being said, I do chair that committee. So I may have <laughs> a little bit of bias. Just as a uh, point of privilege, as someone who sits on a lot of these reports, like uh, committees or study groups or whatever, uh, the, um, it's a very high functioning advisory commission. It's, um, and I, you can thank Drew for that. He really does a really good job of, um, you know, getting everyone um, energized and involved. So um, yeah, good job, Drew. All right, so he's in a pain in the side of more than me. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> in the best way possible though in the best way possible. yes that i meant that too um we, I, we I just call forgot that this is going out to anybody who's listening so i do anyway. see that we're live on youtube <laughs> any more questions or comments or concerns or anything and i think we'll we'll follow this up oh the one thing when you are thinking about what um in terms of um, training money that you might need from new CARES money around the training and the education programs. I know that, um, Dan, you said that uh, getting the 
instructor level and the first response level um, <coughs> programs up was uh, it was a lot of work and the because everybody everybody is so busy dealing with this other stuff it would it be helpful to have an additional person as a point person to do just that uh, so the answer is yes um, uh, what we were really hoping for is we'd have a uh, is to fill our training administrator position, oh, right. okay. which we're in, interviewing for this week again. And, and you guys know the saga of our uh, our trials and tribulations with filling that position. Um, I think if if that doesn't work out uh, and that person cannot be the point person on on most of those projects, then absolutely. Um, and maybe there is some room for a second person in there to. To, to help us shepherd some of these. Um, we'd have to talk about it, but uh, I, yeah. I, it certainly makes sense. Well, it is um, It is unfortunate that you're, you and the, academy, the police academy also are having such a hard time um, recruiting and hiring and getting people here. And I've heard some of it is because it is, it's so, we're so small that there's no kind of ladder for them so people from the outside are saying, why would I come to Vermont? It's just a dead end job. But I will throw this out that we had um, applications for the cannabis control board and there are three positions and there were 94 applicants. So maybe you could recruit some of them. I guess I'm in the wrong line of work. <laughs> I think so. When you do your interviews, if any of them are EMTs, send them our way. <laughs> okay, will do. <clears throat> Any other questions or concerns or anything? All right, well, thank you very much. And thank you for the, the good work, all of you. It's, it's an amazing system we have, I believe. Here, thank here. You. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So committee, remember we're not meeting tomorrow. Good you luck. The day no, our, our hearts are broken. Well, in, in judiciary, we're we looking do? at good time, earned good time, and you've earned good time here. So you get to get the day off. Glad. And um, Tuesday, uh, just to let you know, Tuesday we're going to be, uh, Gail, do you want to join us again? Do we want to go Tuesday. off live? Do we want to go off live? No, we can stay on so that people can hear what we're going to be doing next week in case oh. they have um interest so tuesday i believe that the first thing we're doing is gail do you want to help me out here uh yeah let me look at my notes <clears throat> i have too many pieces of paper we are starting after the budget address we're talking oh, yeah. about the public records of juveniles oh right and that will be our whole afternoon on tuesday and then, and then Wednesday? Wednesday, we are talking about the governor's executive order with DPS. Oh, right. and the a beginning of the reports from the council. Yep. And then we'll be talking about the criminal justice council. Yep. Thursday is elections. Yes. So if anybody has the lists oh, for I me. I got to get you, Ryan. You yes. better get them to me or... Brian already got me his. He did? did? You are mm -hmm. a whiz. Isabel, you said before I bet the weekend. Help. What? You said to get it to before the weekend. I, <laughs> if at all possible, I, I can get them. So I've got them from um, the Secretary of State, from the town clerks, from Brian. I know VPIRG is about to send some in. I've contacted the Campaign for Vermont. And I don't know who else will have lists that they want to put in, but if VLCT or any of you or any of your constituents or groups, this give is them a to me. List? No, oh. this is the list of things Improv. that you want to see changed in our elections laws. Mm. Okay. And then I'm going to make the list over the weekend and I'll get it out to you. And I'm going to try and put them together in kind of categories of things that some are purely administrative 
issues and some are more philosophical issues and mm -hmm. put them together in a list and um, identify who it was that uh, suggested that change. If it was the Secretary of State and the League of Women Voters and the PERG and Senator Clarkson all agree, or it comes from all of their lists, then I'll put that on there so that you can see where, where they come from, unless you would prefer not to see where they came from. Well, I have a little list, but if I could have some, you know, benefit of the doubt from the chair that if I put something on the list that you've talked about ad nauseum and isn't going anywhere, that you just let me know and we take it off the list. Like for example, ballot selfies, you know, which comes up a lot. Well, that I, I, what I'd like to do is get everything on the list. Okay. And then, and then we'll go through the list and see some things we may say, yeah, that's a really nice idea, but I don't think we can do it. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'll just make the list and not put where they came from. That's what I'm going to do. That would help me because I don't want to okay. embarrass myself. Okay, but, but, that's what I'll do. I'll just make the list, put it in categories, kind of, and then, um, <clears throat> and then, and then we'll look then at the list can. and we can deal with them as they come up. And some of them maybe we don't want to deal with at all. Some of them um, we may say this is a nice idea but we don't have time to do it before march uh, and i know um for example um re-looking at the whole way we do public financing might come up as on a list so that's a pretty big issue that's not just can people take a ballot selfie i mean you know so there's different levels of them here but let's get them all out okay does that make sense yes yes just sent mine Okay, and then we'll start taking testimony on the on the kind of categories. And I'd like to, so if we can have the list done by Thursday, then we can line up some people to start looking at the, um, presenting their, their positions on different ones, okay? Perfect. Okay. And there won't be a bill there. We do have one bill, right? One elections bill. Yeah, we can use that as a vehicle or we can create a, town, a committee bill. Oh, I know we'll have more elections bills also. So I know, Keisha? Um, this, is, this is just something I wanna put out in a way that if it can't happen, that's fine. I've told them I would make them a little video instead, but uh, Vermont Law School next Friday afternoon is having their race and the law symposium and they've asked me to speak around 3, 3.30. And I said, I'll try, but if I can't make it, and I know the day before, I will make a video. So um, would you rather I just made a video or do you think there's a chance that it will work out next Friday to leave? A um, <clears throat> we haven't done the schedule yet for Friday, but I, I really hate to see us end at three o'clock on Fridays. I mean, I, I and I know I am, I'm the reason we're not meeting this Friday, so I shouldn't say that, but um, we'll see. Let's see where we, okay. let's see where, we, Gail, do we have anything? So Thursday we have elections, and then we also have Beth Pierce talking about the potential retirement changes that she's proposing. <clears throat> and then we don't have anything on Friday yet, do we? Uh, nothing on the schedule. We tried to move uh, the treasurer to Friday and she's not available. Okay, well, we'll do her like at 3.15 or so on Friday. I mean, on, on Thursday. Thursday, on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Thank you. Anything else? Nope. Oh. Thanks, bye. Have a nice weekend.